of, of saying hello and welcome and introducing and all that good stuff. Okay, here we go. Hi, everybody. Hi, Kim. Hi, Kim. How are you? Hi, Allison. Nice to meet you. It's nice to meet you also. Oh, it's so great to see you, Kim. Is this your office? This is my office at work. So I am I can turn it a little bit. I, I have lots of bright colors and fun signs and whatnot. So, and then I actually have a I don't know if you can see outside um, my window, but I have a little view of the strip. If you kind of crane your neck a little bit and look, you know, sideways, you can. Oh, that's you can, hilarious! Yeah, you can you can see oh. it. So oh, it's that's a so fun view. Yeah, love it. You probably pay a premium for that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's a it's a um, corner. Maybe used to be a broom closet. So yeah, so I'm excited to be here. Oh, that's fun. Oh, awesome. Yeah. I love it. That's so awesome. I loved your ideas. Thank you for for sending those. Happy, so, yeah. happy to help and um, just brainstorm. You know, I'm I'm here to think of what would be useful for you all in spreading your great message of really what I think of when I think of your podcast is positivity in learning. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Um, thank all right. Well, you. we're going to go ahead and get started officially. So. Jake is our producer. So Jake, we're getting started now. <laughs> so good afternoon and Kim, welcome. So well, oh, never mind. We're gonna start that over, Jake. I apologize. <laughs> oh, okay. Good afternoon. Welcome to Learning Reimagined. Today, Sandy and I welcome Kim Nels. Kim, thank you so much for joining us today. Thanks. I'm happy to be here from the campus of UNLV, University of Nevada, Las Vegas. Oh, fantastic. Why don't you tell us a little bit about what you do there? Sure. So I am a lecturer, which means I'm a full-time teaching faculty member at the university. I teach on average four or five classes a semester. That could be at the undergraduate or graduate level. And my area of expertise is marketing and international business. So I'm just loving going to class every day. Now we're back in person for the most part, but we've been online for the majority of the pandemic. And Kim, you have quite an expertise. You yourself are, are an avid learner and you have a few degrees. Would you love to share those with uh, us? <laughs> <laughs> sure. I um, have two bachelors, two masters, and I'm working on my second PhD. So I have a little uh, taste of, of lots of different fields. I have uh, degrees from University of Illinois and Duke University, UNLV, and my current degree is from University of Denver and the Daniel School of Business. So I feel really fortunate that I I'm a lifelong learner. And also I think being a student also helps make me a better instructor as well. Okay, and we need to we need to discuss this a little bit. <laughs> your second PhD, most She's people impressive. don't even get a master's and now you're on your second PhD. Tell, what are they in? My first one is in education. So uh, my first PhD I got in 2007 from UNLV in educational leadership and higher education. Mm -hmm. And that is a wonderful degree. I had a great experience. It took me six years to work on that degree. Um, I decided to go back more recently and pursue another degree because recently I have made the switch to the business school at UNLV and felt like I just wanted to be really on the same level as my peers who are teaching the same classes and also have more opportunities within the business school that would be provided to me with a doctorate in business. Wow. And what's your expected completion date with that one? Well, that's a great question, Allison. <laughs> Don't you know you're never supposed to ask a doc student when <laughs> I know. I like to put the pressure I, on. No, uh, realistically, I'm I'd love to be done this summer. I mean, real if, if, if possible. So I wow. am what's called ABD right now. So if you're um, familiar with that term, it means all but dissertation. 
which yeah. means that I've completed all my coursework. I finished all of my comps, which are comprehensive exams. So at this point, it's just on me to write my dissertation and get through And that what is that topic? Great question. I'm working on a topic called Forgotten on the Front Lines. And I mentioned this to Sandy. Uh, this is a topic that I think is really important to study specifically during the pandemic. It's folks who are primarily low wage workers who have uh, really been the front lines of our workforce. It can be folks who are working the grocery stores, working um, in casinos, hotels, hospitals, prisons even, all these workplaces did not close during the pandemic. And I feel like we're missing the that group of individuals who are still so essential in our workforce, but we don't necessarily hear their stories every day. We hear a lot about working from home. We hear a lot about healthcare, but there's a lot of folks who are the backbone of our economy and our society today. That's and I'm trying to bring those to, to light. I can't wait to read that. Once you're done, of course. <laughs> no, <laughs> you. Hey, me too. <laughs> <laughs> Phenomenal. And yes, yeah, such an, an, a significant part of our population that we don't hear enough about. So it's amazing. And bringing it back to you, NLV, you were honored by students as have as nominating you for the faculty award last fall, I believe. That that's incredible. It just speaks to how appreciated you are and the level of involvement. And I'm just, it's such an honor to have you here that today. So thank you. Well, Can you explain thanks. what the faculty award is for and who, what type of people are recipients or nominees? Sure. So uh, I received the faculty engagement award from our student government on campus. So for me, it's probably the most significant teaching award I've ever received because it's for and by the students. Mm -hmm. Not only that, but it was given during the peak of the pandemic when a lot of things were just in such upheaval on campus. You know, things moved quickly in the online format. Uh, we were adjusting every day in the classroom, wearing our masks, still trying to stay engaged, still trying to have this sense of belonging, still trying to just keep it together in any way we possibly could. And so to be honored with a faculty engagement award by the student government during that time was fantastic. And there were um, folks recognized across campus um, from a variety of roles, but it it truly means so much. I mean, it really meant the world to me. But it, that's, a what an honor, an honor for you and now an honor for us to, to be here with you, for you to share some time with us. I really appreciate it. But you're really doing the work. You're doing it out there. You're making a difference. You're so. such a force in higher ed. And I don't believe just here within our community by UNLV, but just I know you've presented at other campuses and part of different organizations. And I just it's such you're such a role model to others in higher ed. So I am really excited to hear more about how do you connect with your students? So this the sense of belonging that you just mentioned. Yeah, that's a, a great question. So what I perceive as a sense of belonging may be different for everybody, but you know, I would ask you to think about what makes you really feel connected, whether it's at work or in school or in a classroom setting or even out in the community. What, what makes you think of that feeling of connectedness? So for me in the classroom, I feel like it is a sense of acceptance of all students, inclusion. I recognize different identities and I want people to be able to bring their authentic selves into the classroom. And I have seen when students don't feel that sense of connection, they don't feel like they, they don't belong and they, they don't give their best effort. They simply don't give their best performance in the classroom. Um, and so I feel like when they're engaged and excited and they have that sense of belonging, it really matters. It matters for their connection to the class, but also to the wider school and the community and the campus. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I really, I really want them to stay motivated and connected. I think there's a lot of ways we can do that, but 
you know, I'd like to ask you all, you know, that question that I said at the beginning, what, what kind of makes you feel connected or engaged either at work or school or in a class? Uh, it really I, is. Oh, go ahead, Sandy. Yeah, no, I, I, I just, not just being a student, but like you said, Kim, it's just even in our workplace or any room that we enter. Um, and it, it's fascinating because I know you said you work with undergrads and having them feel like they belong and reaching out to them that helps with the retention mm -hmm. and i just think it's it's tied into so much especially not that it was not important in yesteryear but just it's so vital mm -hmm. vital mm -hmm. and as we go to an online format that they feel heard mm -hmm. i think that's and for me answering your question if i feel heard i it, just being engaged, I think that's a big piece. Yeah, and I, I would agree with Sandy, being heard is so so vital. And, and that feeling of connectedness, um, connectedness, excuse me, that <clears throat> especially in what we have gone through the past two years, to have connection with other humans. And I, I am the epitome of a people person. And so the lockdown was especially hard on me because I, I mean, I had my family together, which was lovely, but I, I, I like lots of people. <laughs> and so it was really hard for me for, you know, whatever it was, the six weeks, but not having even just, I'm the person that talks to the grocery store clerk. I saw people in the aisle and talk about their shoes. I, that's, I embarrass my kids, but it, it's, that's just who I am. I can't help it. And that, that I think is the most that, that's like the essence of the human spirit is that connection, you know, just being able to share a smile, share a look, just having that. And, and I think that's really truly what um, makes me motivated and keeps me here. And, and I think so much for, for our students and their population, they need that too. It doesn't matter that they're stinky teenagers, they still need to have connections with adults. And, and just with other humans. And so that has, since we started our school, gosh, 16 years ago now, that has always been the foundation is creating a sense of community. And so when, when the pandemic started, we always said, you know, we already got this. We know what we're doing. We know how to create the community and keep it rolling for these kids. And I really feel for our staff, for our students, for the families involved, it was seriously a salvation. It really kept all of us going just to be able to have it. Yeah, we all get the Zoom fatigue, but at least we have that technology in which to have, you know, the sharing of the smiles and the looks and the just the connection of the human spirit. I love what you just shared, Allison. And I, I really want to emphasize that sense of belonging doesn't have to be in an in-person environment. It mm -hmm. absolutely can be online. And mm -hmm. I think that that's a really important aspect. But the idea is you need to be intentional about it. And that intentionality, I think, is what can make the difference mm -hmm. and really, truly create that sense of community for folks. So some things if you're interested that I purposefully incorporate into my classroom are, I create a lot of group work, which I know students have a tendency to issue <laughs> group work and say, mm -hmm. oh my gosh, you know, that's, but even low stakes group work, I think is really important, you know, where it's not necessarily for a grade. It can be just figuring out how to solve a problem or in an international business class, you know, for example, we may talk about how supply chains have been disrupted during the pandemic. And we have container ships sitting off the coast of California right now. And whether that's due to labor shortage or um, issues with not being able to get the products from one country to another, we have to solve those problems. So let's get together in small groups and tackle this idea. Mm -hmm. What can we do? And that can be done in an online environment or in, per, in person. And I think that that is, you know, those, even those low stakes type of discussions or group work, I think is really important. Um, another thing that I do is I try to really engage in purposeful storytelling in class, uh, which I think is very important. I encourage the students to share their stories, but I also want 
to have stories and what I call case studies in my business classes that shows different layers and dimensions of diversity. And so, for example, my cases will reflect the student body at UNLV, which is very much students of color, very much first generation students, um, different religions, different backgrounds, immigrants, some undocumented, folks from all different walks of life. And so I want them to see that reflected in the stories and in the case studies that I bring into class. So I will show a CEO who happens to be an African-American. Um, I will show a CEO in class who's a refugee. I'll um, have a example case study of someone who is LGBTQ. I, I really want the students reflected in the classroom. And so mm -hmm. many times when we think CEO, for example, in the business classroom, we think a white man in a suit or someone who is pale male and stale or a young guy in a hoodie. And I think that we really need to challenge those types of stereotypes mm -hmm. with that purposeful <clears throat> storytelling. I love, I love all of that. Um, intentionality. Yeah. I think that is such a vital thought process. It is just such to have intentionality in what you say and what you do and how you spend your time. To me, that is the difference in everything. I mean, in, in, all, rea I mean, in all regards, I, I started taking yoga, total side note, but they start each class with, you know, you sit there quietly, set your intention for the next 60 minutes. And it, it's interesting, I've taken that actually off the mat now. And I think about that intentionality, what is my goal for this weekend? What is my goal for the next 30 minutes? What is, you know, and I think, and I try to act very in, with intention with my, with everybody and with myself. And it, it really makes a difference. And I think that is truly the core for the human connection is to have that intentionality with your interactions. And it makes a huge difference in how you communicate with people and, um, and the outcome. And I, I'd love to just even extend this. And, and Kim, I just, I, I have such respect for you in a professional way. And also I know your three incredible children and you bring this intentionality to your family life. Mm. I see the, the vacations that you all travel and, and it's just everything from, from whether they're all athletes, they're all incredible stellar students, but it's just, you do this, not just in one aspect of your life, but I see it done in all aspects of, of who you are. And I, I love that so much because you just really, shed so much light into how we can be better moms, better friends, better people. And that I think helps us all on, on so many, so many ways. It's so I, I love that you do that. <laughs> well, thank you. You know, I, I like to think of, um, you know, that, you know, the, the intentionality does mm -hmm. spill over to other aspects of life and, uh, you know, I, I do happen to have great kids as do you, <laughs> and, you know, and I, and I'm, I feel very fortunate, but I, I love the fact that we do like being together and, and doing things together as a group and, um, having, you know, I have three teenagers so that it's not always perfect. I, you know, I certainly don't want to paint that picture, but I think that it's important to create opportunities for, uh, the kids to, be able to experience life in different cultures. And just like I do in the classroom, you know, hearing different stories and, it, um, and, and seeing that, you know, there isn't just one right way of being a family or there's no mm -hmm. one right way of seeing a, a CEO reflected in a story or, um, you know, being a star employee or being a star student. I mean, I think there's a lot of different ways that that can be reflected. And I, I really try to emphasize that at, at home and in the classroom too. What age are your, are your kids? 
14, 16, 18. So I have two in high school and one in middle school, and they are all really involved in lots of activities. Mm -hmm. And uh, so as an example, tonight I have a flag football game, a basketball practice, and a basketball game. And I'm not sure how I'm going to make it to all of them <laughs> sometimes. <laughs> don't you feel like you just need to figure out like how to clone yourself or like right. get through so many different things? And you know, you have work responsibilities and just that that balance is is mm -hmm. really important. How how do you share with your kids and how do you teach them to live with intentionality? Ooh, that's a great question. Well, I think um, part of it is I encourage them to really get involved in school. They all go to Title I schools, which means uh, that they are in a you know, incredibly diverse environment from socioeconomic status and um, backgrounds. And I think that that is part of what makes their experience really rich and diverse and is that class. by design or by happenstance um we've been we've purposefully had them attend magnet schools that are mm -hmm. title one schools that that's really important to us mm -hmm. so that i i think that that's that's been a really key um, part of their upbringing. And in fact, mm -hmm. right now, my son Grant, who's 18, is going through the college admissions process. And I've talked oh, to- Oh, that's exciting. Yeah, Sandy about it. And it, it's exciting, but it's also stressful. And it's a lot of work putting together all these applications and essays. And there's so much involved in it. I think, honestly, when I first applied for undergraduate, I sent off my transcript and my test scores and hope for the best. And nowadays it's it's so much more work than that and all these essays. But the, I was gonna bring it back to my son Grant is, is, has written a lot of his essays about um, his school, his experiences um, just uh, with, with so many different people, also traveling a lot as Sandy alluded to, which has been really eye-opening for him as well, being able to experience the world, but he also says he experiences the world at his cafeteria table, which I thought was a really cool. That's um, cool. Yeah. yeah, that is a really cool way of, of incorporating uh, just that intentionality into everyday life. Mm -hmm. Oh, that, that's, he, Grant sounds amazing. <laughs> yeah. he he has, I'm biased. I, I, I'm a little biased. I think he's fantastic, but yeah, I think, you know, I think it's really, you know, we've had, we've been very fortunate because we like to give our kids experiences as opposed mm -hmm. to material things. And so we've done a lot of great traveling and part of the traveling has been to places like Peru uh, and Japan. We were in Iceland last year. Um, we visited family in Europe. Um, yeah, we've, so we've had just such great experiences traveling mm -hmm. as a family. And I think Partly that brings you really close together. There's, you know, when you're all five of you in a hotel room, you know, there's, you know, you, you just learn to uh, get along and, and have fun in that regards. But I also think that, um, you know, it makes you appreciate different cultures, different languages, mm -hmm. uh, different lifestyles and, and what, you know, we might consider, a, you know, a good food or a good, um, experience in the U.S. is might be completely different halfway around the world. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's that's fantastic! Your kids are very lucky to have that with you. To have those type of experiences, I think is it it really molds a person. It just keeps you so much more aware of the world. And I imagine you're not going to these great places and just staying at a really nice hotel and they, you know just doing the typical tourist things I imagine you are getting in there and digging deep yeah I you know I think that's really important you know going and experiencing Peru in a moto taxi which is like three soles it's the equivalent to less than a dollar you know you can pay and you just say you know take us to the town square and let's you know eat some food and, and enjoy uh, uh, you know, the, the experience and the local culture and the music and the people. And, and I think that's really, really essential. It, it, you know, it's, it's so much a part of um, just, again, learning about the world, but mm -hmm. um, having that 
uh, just being a, a part of um, a world culture, I think is really mm -hmm. important. Mm -hmm. And and even bringing it into the United States, you take advantage of that spirit, even in your travels here. I remember you posting something like, um, I, I, I think it was like, look at the ads at your local airport. And as you travel through, and as I touched so many airports, I, I became much more aware. I'm like, oh my gosh, look at that university, or look at that, look at what their branding is. And just the awareness of our surroundings, it's, it was very insightful. And I know you do that on a daily. Yeah, well, I really try to bring that, again, to talk back to the classroom, you know, I, I try to bring that awareness into the classroom, you know, how are you experiencing things? And especially because I teach marketing and international business, having students really reflect on the ads that they're consuming every single day, you know, mm -hmm. we are exposed to, I think it's something like 4,000 different ads every day, which seems mind blowing, like how could it possibly be 4,000 ads? But if you think about, you know, you're driving to work, um, perhaps you, see um, billboards, a bus stop, a t taxi top, um, mm -hmm. you hear ads on the radio, you have them on the TV in the background, you know, it could be you're just- Pop-ups on your computer now too. Yes, ex exactly, YouTube. I, I get 4,000 of those a day, just in that area. <laughs> I know, even with ad block, I, I still yes. have so frustrating. YouTube popping up with, with ads. You know, and, I, and so I think we're inundated with that, but I want the students to, to notice that and pay attention to it and think about it. And um, what messages are they receiving? And are they good? Are they bad? How are they interpreted? How might this look for somebody from a different culture or a different country? Interesting. You know, I, I, I want them to, to think more intentionally about, about those aspects of, of just marketing and advertising. I want to take your class. That just sounds so thought provoking, doesn't it? I love it. I, I just, I, it's so amazing. And it's, it's just, I love great. it. Uh, you know, just to give an example, one of the, one of the things that we talked about in class was underwear. And I know students are like, oh my gosh, this is so embarrassing. My instructor is talking about underwear. However, uh, you know, you think about like a typical underwear model and, you know, what, what does that mean and how are they portrayed? Um, and then I will bring into class an example of a disruption in the underwear business. It's um, one example is Parade. I don't know if you've heard of that brand. It is relatively new, young. I think it just started in 2019. So it's only about three, four years old at this point. It was started um, by a woman named Cami Tellez. She is a um, daughter of Latin American immigrants to the US. And she really wanted to design soft and eco-friendly underwear for all ages, sizes, shapes, colors, and it has disrupted the underwear business. So now it's a $130, $140 million business that Parade um, has created. And it's also unique in the sense that their advertisements really issue Photoshop, which is very rare in, I'm uh, assuming, in, in the underwear modeling business. Um, so things like, scars, moles, stretch marks, cellulite, um, you know, things that are probably not acceptable in mm -hmm. another like window store or might not be acceptable in a glossy magazine ad for mm -hmm. underwear probably is not acceptable is, is encouraged in parade. Um, and they have really built this following because of that. And so I think that that's really important to discuss those sorts of disruptors in, mm -hmm. in the field as well. So when we're talking about whether it's, you know, advertising or business, who is making a difference? And, and uh, you know, a lot of it is young, um, yeah, young entrepreneurs, but mm -hmm. it's entrepreneurs of any age that are, are willing to take a chance and do something different than the norm. And I, I, you know, I love that. And so that's just one example of, it's fresh on my mind because we just discussed it in, in class. Um, but I, again, my whole idea with even mentioning that is that it's, 
you, know, you have to be intentional again about what is acceptable, what is considered normal. Um, and, you know, I don't necessarily like that word, but you know, when you see um, folks who are unique and uh, you know, just how they present with underwear, it, it just makes you feel like, wow, I can be an underwear model too. Which right. definitely I don't want to be, but maybe you two are interested. <laughs> I've already been there. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> no, that that's fantastic because you. Right, I have two girls, two daughters, and that was something that always, you you, you want so much as you're raising f girls, especially, but boys as well, to have a positive body image and not to be com com constantly comparing yourself to the Victoria's Secret models. And I, I love the idea of parade. I, I'm I am going to become a customer because I think that's fabulous and it's so important. I, I remember when I was in college, I took a marketing class, and they just they showed um, a, a an actual print ad what we see, and then they saw it prior to being edited, and I'm like, that could be any girl in this room. Any one of us could be that model. But then they they do so much airbrushing and whatnot to make that a completely different person. And it's an unfair comparison for the common person. Um, and, and so that was something that I always tried to reiterate to my kids as, you know, as they're growing up and learning and experiencing the world. And it, it just, Parade is really onto it. That's awesome. Yeah, one thing I should also mention is that they, um, you know, primarily design underwear for women, but it's also individuals who identify as women, uh, you know, so it's very trans friendly, um, femme identifying, and so that's reflected in their social media posts as well, and I think that's uh, an important recognition too. Um, and also because uh, you know, a lot of my students in class uh, identify on the LGBTQ uh, spectrum, I think that it's really important for them to recognize that ads can look like them as mm -hmm. well. So mm -hmm. uh, that was something that uh, you know, just popped into my mind as well as we're discussing yeah. this topic. But it's just so important to bring that awareness as a consumer to, mm -hmm. to be looking to look at advertisements differently than you know what what is their intent and you know what so for for the consumer they're just trying to get you to buy their stuff so think and you think of that think of it more objectively just knowing what their end goal is you could be a little bit more critical as you you view it so it's neat to bring that kind of awareness what you're doing with your kids and, and like what you said, Kim, about the disruptor and, and helping these students take mm -hmm. that road less traveled, mm -hmm. that there is so much room for opportunity and for them to really just go after that passion, whatever that might be, and not being afraid. You really allow these kids to think outside of the traditional textbook box <laughs> that, that we grow up with. So that, that's wonderful. What a gift. Well, thanks. I think part of it is creating trusting spaces as well. And I haven't really mentioned trust, but that's something that I think is important because um, I, I just want students to feel comfortable in, in a classroom space or, you know, in an environment where they feel like uh, it's okay to take chances. It's okay to bring up these crazy ideas. Uh, you know, today I'm wearing glasses by Warby Parker. I don't know if you've mm -hmm. heard of that mm -hmm. brand. Of, of course. Warby Parker disrupted the uh, industry of eyeglasses, you know, mm -hmm. and so, it, you know, it's amazing how much disruption is part of my life now. You know, if I take an Uber, I think about how that disrupted the taxi industry. If I stay at an Airbnb, that disrupted the entire hotel industry. Now, more people stay at Airbnbs than in hotels around the world. I mean, it's just crazy how much, uh, you know, just thinking about things a little bit differently or coming up with a creative, almost crazy out of that box idea is, uh, you know, can, can truly change an entire industry. But I think part of it hinges on that trust factor. Like, do I feel confident and committed to be able to bring that forward, mm -hmm. uh, whether it's in a classroom or beyond? 
What types of things do you do in your classroom to help create that, especially during the pandemic when you were online? Yeah, I, I think that's I think that's really important. And I think part of it is, uh, you know, just showing that by example, you know, making sure that again, like the, the parade example, I, you know, I don't want to belabor that point, but um, whether or, um, you know, another example is, I don't know if you've heard of Serial Killer's Kitchen. It's a um, cereal spelled like the tasty breakfast treat, not like <laughs> cereal killer. Like, yeah. uh, it is owned by an African-American family. One of their children has special needs. It's a local in Las Vegas um, company that started here and it's a, considered a cereal bar. It's a place where you can go and pick all, you know, of a hundred different kinds of cereal, you have opportunities to try and taste all different types. Um, and you can get, you know, milkshakes with cereal and whatnot. I mean, all sorts of fun things. But again, it was just a, um, it, it creating that sense of um, opportunity for students to see mm -hmm. themselves in these examples in, in class, I think is, is really important. And and that that's part of really what I think creates trust. Um, mm -hmm. Also, just being open and honest with students and being able for them to share their ideas, their best mm -hmm. selves. Um, and their best selves doesn't always mean that they're perfect and positive and just got an A on a test. It can mean that they are willing to be vulnerable and share and, you know, something that happened to them or um, you know, that they're struggling with or they're concerned with or, you know, something that might have just happened with the pandemic or somebody in their family is ill. Um, I think when people feel like they can share ideas and contribute and confidently speak up, then that creates that sense of trust that that makes a difference. That's fantastic. I, I'm sure you are making a difference in your kids. Your students feel that. I, I say kids, but they're in I, they're in college, so they're not kids anymore. But I'm sure that they they feel that in, in your classroom. You create such a really neat community within your student with your classrooms. Thanks. I I hope so. I you know I just got a, a graduation card from one of them, and uh, I was so you know I I get so excited when I see them. Uh, pursue their dreams and, and just mm -hmm. pursue higher education. You know, as I mentioned right at the beginning, many of my students are the first in their families to pursue mm -hmm. higher education. And, and so I think it's really, you know, important to recognize that and, and recognize the fact that they are doing so much to, to just stay in school, to finish, to try to be retained. And I, you know, I, I really want to, I really want to recognize all the hard work that my amazing students are, are doing. You know, one, one of my students just uh, graduated and got a job with IBM. Uh, they wow. are, I mean, I'm just so, I'm just so excited to, to hear of their successes because in a small way, I feel like their successes are my successes. Uh, and, you know, it, it just makes me so happy. To, to that. I, I'm sure all educators feel that way, whether it's like, you know, kindergarten uh, through K-12 through, you know, higher ed and beyond, but it is, it's, yeah, it's so exciting to see them happy, successful, and pursuing their dreams out in the world. As, that's uh, a huge as a difference. First... Oh, go ahead, Sandy. No, no, no. Just uh, as a first generation myself, Kim, to have a professor like you'd be so engaged and, mm -hmm. and to understand that there's so many unknowns <laughs> that professors aren't always aware of, of what's happening on the home front, that it's just different than other students and, and just all the dynamics. It's, it speaks volumes to having them feel like they are understood. <laughs> and, and it's just, it, when they keep in touch with you years after they've taken that semester, mm -hmm. it it really is a reflection of how what an impact you did make in that in that mm -hmm. person's life. So, and I think you're right. These teachers, especially these last two years, how do you reach out to these kids and help them feel heard or um, that they matter? And whether the student is in kindergarten or middle school, there's so much that's impacting their universe that with social media, it, 
we often think of, of there's a lot of negative things that are pulling at them. And so how are these other wonderful dynamics helping to get them into a better head space mm -hmm. and heart space? So I think, I think the biggest difference, it sounds like with Kim, she's just, she's truly invested in each and every one of her kids. And I think having that investment in their well-being and in their success, that you, you truly are, you're in it. You're in it for the long haul with these kids. And they can, I mean, I, in fairness with you, I feel it. So I'm sure your students over a semester feel that as well. I, I just, you are the, what we need in education. It's that type of intentionality and just passion for, for the kids that makes a real big difference. Um, Would you believe you, that, oh, sorry. I was gonna say, this is gonna sound sad and I don't think this is unique to UNLV, but sometimes students will tell me that I'm the first professor that has learned their name. And I think that's, you know, just a very small, small thing that I do, but I, I really want each student to feel important. And again, coming back to that sense of belonging, that sense mm -hmm. of connection, um, yeah. you know, and I know maybe in a class of 200, 300 students, that's difficult. My classes are not small though. I should mention that too. Most of my classes have 60 or 70 students in them. Uh, and I really try to make sure I know every single person's name, you know, what are their, what are their majors, their goals, their, their future plans. That also means I'm writing a lot of recommendation letters. Yes. <laughs> yes. Uh, you know, a lot of that work, unfortunately, doesn't necessarily go on my annual review or anything, but it goes on my, um, I don't know, my personal values, right? It, it's important to me and to to think that maybe I played a part in them getting into law school and MBA, graduate school, PhD program, you know, that, that, that's important to me. That, that's just, it's crazy to think that just learning someone's names makes a difference, but it truly does. It goes back to being heard, being a part of a community, all of that. And, and it does, it makes a difference. I've referenced this book before on our podcast and it's, um, I can't remember the author off the top of my head, but it's, yes, my teenager is crazy. <laughs> and it's, it's, the title is catchy. It's very funny, but it's, it's true. The, the teenage brain is so it's, it's not stable. There's so much going on um, in, in a teenager's brain that whatever stability that we could provide is, is so important. And they, um, in just the first chapter, I learned so much. And so I tell people, read just the first chapter. That's just get through that and you'll, you'll be hooked. And um, they talk about the, the innate need to belong. Mm -hmm. And when teenagers, well, when they first, you know, 13 year olds, when they first start becoming this crazy teenage brained person, they are going into middle school and they've gone from being in Mrs. Barnes's fifth grade class to now being in seven different classes where they typically are just a number um, because they have you know, over 200 court kids in the day, they aren't right. taking that time. And so they don't belong anywhere. Mm -hmm. And so they will go to whatever group pulls the hardest. And so that's one of the things that I, I used to teach um, fifth and sixth grade. So I would always tell my parents, make sure your student is involved in something. They need to have a sense of belonging. Um, or bad things can happen. You know, if it's the drug dealers that pull the hardest, there's an opportunity for them to go that route rather than honor school route or whatever it happens to be. So um, you learning their names really lets them feel that sense of community, you know, and, and that's scientific, that's clinical, that is, that's a proven thing. Just having that sense of belonging, that alone makes it, the biggest difference in, in a student's day. So thank you for taking the time to do that. And thank you for just having that just investment in, in our kids. You know, I it just, it's, it's amazing. You're, you're wonderful. And I, I'm hoping other educators who are listening, just really take that time to just invest. And um, I, I think most educators aren't in education for any other purpose other than their compassion for students and for learning. I, I really, truly do. But I believe also the past two years have been a big kick in the shins for most of us, uh, teachers especially. And I, I think it would be very easy to get off the track and to lose your 
compassion and to just really get diverted. And so I, I think having you on today has just, it's a great reminder of the basics of, you know, build that sense of community and belongingness with your kids. It doesn't matter if they know how to multiply eight times five today. It matters that they feel cared about, you know, so thank you. Yeah, I'm being in that safe environment. And uh, my, my two, they're in college now and it, they still feel that I wanna belong. I wanna feel mm -hmm. like this is my second home. And my son, I call him up, he calls me and he's like, I love all of my professors. <laughs> and I honestly don't think I ever said that in any given, in any given semester or quarter. Mm -hmm. So it was just, it filled me with such joy that they care to invest in him and to make him feel like he belongs, even though he's in a zip code very far from me right now. So <laughs> it's exciting. And, and, that, and that's the joy that you bring to your students. And I, I just, that's so incredible. Kim, I have to ask you before we wrap up, how, what fills your cup? How do you get all your energy every morning? What, what, what brings it to you? I, I know that it has to be something. <laughs> Give us that secret. Uh, you know, I, I, I think that it's, it really is the, the joy that I get out of work. I know that there's, it's so cliche to say, if you do what you love, you don't work a day in your life. But I truly believe that part of my purpose is being in the classroom and making a difference in student lives and being able to uh, invest in them, you know, filling them up helps fill my cup as well. And so I feel really lucky every day that I can be in the classroom, uh, make a difference in lives. I, uh, you know, I, I, I truly enjoy what I do. I've taken on another administrative role recently um, in I'm going to be doing external relations for our college as well, meaning that I get to work in the community and share these stories of students and also work on fundraising. And I feel like that's just one more way that I get to fill up the students. You know, if we can take off some of that financial pressure of our students as well when they're in higher ed, that's even one more way that I feel purpose in, in what I'm doing. So I really, truly love what I do and I feel grateful for that. And I think sometimes it's not always easy. I don't want to, you know, sugarcoat it. Like this is, you know, the greatest job in the universe. But <laughs> I, I really do feel that I am lucky every day I get to be in that classroom and, and learn from the students. One thing that just really moved me, Kim, is that you took on a new administrative role and you said, I get to do X, Y, and Z. It's not, I have to. Mm -hmm. and you're truly honoring your your position it's just it, that's that makes a difference that, that just those the change in the word get and need and that that changes your whole perspective of your job so that that's just amazing but it, it's I'm overwhelmed listening to you with all of the things that you are doing plus having three kids and getting pulled in a thousand different directions so what do you do for you in this day and age of mental health and being aware of, of our limits and our own personal well being, what do you do for Kim? Yeah, uh, I, you know, I definitely do take time to relax and have fun. And, you know, whether that is, um, I love to be outdoors, go for hikes, go for walks. I also love uh, to watch Netflix. You know, I'm like everybody else. I, I enjoy that <laughs> and just the idea of decompressing and, mm -hmm. um, you know, and, and watching Ted Lasso on Apple TV plus or whatever, I, you know, who doesn't love that? You know, we are huge Ted Lasso fans <laughs> in this house. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I think you could do a whole, I think you could do a whole program on, um, life lessons from Ted Lasso and, and maybe how that could, uh, you know, incorporate into, education as well um but absolutely I think, yeah i think that so things like that i mean i, I want to be very realistic that mm -hmm. yes i i do work a lot there's no doubt you know, i was sending emails at midnight 1 a.m i actually put them on uh a don't send until 6 or 7 a.m because i don't want people to even know that i'm doing work in the middle of the night but <laughs> 
<laughs> um, but that being said, I, I think it's, I, you know, even though I do work a lot, I, I, it, it is enjoyable for me. And, mm -hmm. but I, I do try to have that balance as well. Okay. I think having three kids, three t busy teenagers makes that also very much possible as well. You know, tonight mm -hmm. I will completely disconnect while I'm at a flag football game. I'll completely disconnect while I'm at a basketball game. And yeah. I think they put things in perspective for you too. You know, yeah. when they call you a boomer, when they call you, you know, when <laughs> you're uh, not very smart. It's nice to have that reassurance that it, you know, really brings it all down to earth. Keeps you grounded. Keeps you grounded. That's for sure. <laughs> Well, Kim, it's been so such an honor. Mm -hmm. It really has been. Thank you. Thank you I've so much. Talking with you too. Thanks, Sandy. Thanks, Allison, for your Thank time. Thank you. It was talent as always. It's great to have you. Have a Thank wonderful you, Kim. Rest of the have day. a wonderful day. Thanks.